really pissed them off. Lars Larson, weeknight, 6 to 9, on Talk Radio 570 KVI. Back we are. It's John Carlson, Talk Radio 570 KVI. You know, it may be 6.35 here in Seattle, which makes it only 9.35 in the morning in Washington, D.C., but it's already the highlight of Jim McDermott's day because here he is joining me on KVI right now. Hey, Congressman McDermott, how are you? Good morning, John. I couldn't wait to get up when I knew I was going to be on the air with you. <laughs> we really appreciate that. Hey, but by the way, be, before we we start going back and forth on the sequester and spending, can I ask you a question tapping your expertise as a psychiatrist? Okay, it's a completely non-political uh, issue. Well, I... I can't imagine something that's non-political, but go okay. ahead. Well, you're right. It does have a political component, but I'm at 7-Eleven about 4 in the morning, downtown Seattle, and you can guess what kind of people sometimes go to 7-Eleven at 4 in the morning. Yes. There's a woman in there who is clearly deranged, clearly mentally ill, not coherent. She was trying to steal food, and they were going to call the cops, and she puts money on the counter and finally leaves, and she's ranting and raving, you know, that kind of thing. And she leaves and goes out into the middle of the night. And I'm in the store watching all this happen. And I'm saying, you know, there was a time when someone like that would have been institutionalized. And now, you know, we say, well, we'll let you, you know, cope in uh, in the world with, you know, medication and, and support. But it just seems hideously cruel that when someone literally can't take care of themselves, Jim, cannot make rational choices. Why shouldn't someone like that be institutionalized, getting three square meals a day and and being looked after because they can't look after themselves? Well, John, you've, you've got a subject for another day, yeah, another yeah, program. It, but, but it just happened this morning. The fact is so. that that when we changed the law on civil commitment back in the 70s, I was in the legislature actually, when it changed in the state of Washington, we made it very difficult to put people uh, into uh, a locked locked wards. Right. And and when we did that, we we simply uh, put them out on the street with the promise that there would be money for mental health centers and that there would be uh, coverage in that in that way. But in fact, it didn't happen. And, and so we closed Northern State Hospital. Right. Uh, the streets filled up with people laying over the grates, sleeping. And uh, we really one of the, I mean, everybody's talking about mental health with relationship to all this, uh, all the gun violence and so forth. And there were, needs to be a time to go back and rethink that. When I was, in 1979, I was the jail psychiatrist at King County, and I ran the jail uh Psychiatrist, I was there uh, and had the second largest mental hospital in the state. Right. Mm -hmm. Western was mm -hmm. larger, but I had 120 people every night who were clearly mentally ill and uh, were there because there was no other place. Now, if you want to look at the story even further, if you go out into the community today, and I can give you the name of some nurses who are on to this issue. They are parking mentally ill patients in medical surgical wards in places like Northwest Hospital hmm. because they don't they can't keep them in the emergency room, they can't move them to the state mental hospital. They don't want to put them in jail, so they put them on the floor. And one of the nurses I know uh, got attacked by one of these yeah. patients because the patient was clearly in the wrong place. It shouldn't be on a medical surge ward. So you're this is a huge issue that that uh, need, the state needs to face and um, the well, country I, needs to face. Okay, well, you know what? I would like to talk to you about, about it in much more detail later on um, and tapping your experience and expertise, not just as a former state legislator, but, of course, as a psychiatrist, because it just seems to me wrong in a society like ours that someone like that should be roaming around with no one really taking care of themselves when it's clear she can't take care of herself. But anyway, well, let's put, another day. Put yes, put that issue aside uh, because we want to go from her to Nancy Pelosi here. Here's what. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. 
Th- this is Nancy Pelosi uh, earlier in the week. So it, right. it is uh, almost a false argument to say we have a spending problem. We have a budget deficit problem that we have to address. Okay. It's a false argument to say we have a spending problem. Do you believe that, Congressman McDermott? I believe that um, political theorists on one side of the aisle have polled for the word spending, and it polls very well. People like that. You should stop spending. But the fact is that they don't say, well, should we have paid for the two wars that we got into? We never raised taxes to pay for those wars, and we never paid for the uh, Part D drug benefit that uh, the Bush administration put in. Prescription Medicare. drug benefit. Mm-hmm. Yes. And we, we, we simply gave tax cuts uh, very early on in the Bush administration. All of those were spending that people uh, didn't have any problem with. And my belief is that if you're going to be serious about this, you have to look at what the sources of our, our problem are now. It is, it is spending, certainly, uh, but it's health care spending for people who are living longer on Medicare. Our biggest problem in our budget is uh, the cost of Medicare, medical care mm-hmm. in, this, in this country. And, and the other things, the, the war expenditure in Afghanistan, as the president announced last night, is going to come down. And you're going to have a reduction in, in the, the pharmaceutical benefit, the Accountable Care Act, took care of some of that. We put money in to actually pay for it. But you're going to have to, at some point, get a hold of medical costs in this country. They continue to rise. Actually, actually Medicare itself is flat. It has been flat for the last several years in terms of the amount of money we spend per person on a Medicare patient. So we're not spending more. We're just having more people come in. As right. of and it's, so it's an automatic driver. Yep. It's an automatic driver that started in 2011 because everybody born after the Second World War that we call a baby boomer is now 65 or beginning to be 65, and they are pouring into Medicare and Social Security. And, and simply, we're dealing with demographics. Yes. Yes. Okay. Now, with that said, what did you think of the president's address last night? Well, I I think first of all, um, the numbers about the deficit itself are coming down. Uh, 2011, uh, the deficit was 1.4 trillion, and then the next year it was 1.1, and this year the deficit is going to be about 850. So it's coming down, and as a percentage of GDP. It's actually dropped almost in half. So the deficit is being taken care of in part by people going back to work and and uh, the economy picking up little by little. Um, Didn't the economy actually have zero, minus zero growth in the fourth quarter? In the, yes, that's true. And, and there are one of the things that's a problem with what's going on with this um, continual uh, chaos in Washington is that business isn't going no businessman in his right mind or her right mind is going to go out and invest their money when they can't tell what the tax rate's going to be or what's going to happen in society so this continual bobbing around that we do every two months two months two months we're going to have the uh, sequester in two months or in two months or in, that that makes too much uncertainty for anybody to Hey, let's hire two more people so we can sell more right. or make more of our widgets. So we need to get these things resolved to get some stability in the society. Okay, now here's what it seems to me, uh, Congressman McDermott. Uh, the sequester is an automatic, across-the-board, indiscriminate uh, series of budget cuts to discretionary and, and military spending totaling about $1.2 trillion over 10 years. The Republican majority has said, well, here's our plan. Uh, that would make that same amount of deficit reduction in a different way. President doesn't like the sequester. President doesn't like the Republican uh, budget cut pr- uh, alternative. But what would his alternative be? What would the House Democrats' alternative to sequester be? Well, I think you'll find that out as we, we play out the the hearings. We're starting hearings today. Uh, the CBO uh, director, Doug Elmendorf, will be there for the 
for the uh, committee hearing today. And and as we lay it out, I think it's possible for us to find some common ground. I don't think this is an insoluble. There's nothing politically that's insoluble. It's only insoluble if people don't sit down at the table. And I frankly, I'm just as pleased that the president stays away from the table. Let the let the members of the House and Senate, which is what the Constitution says, should be the source of those solutions. Um, I I'm perfectly willing to sit down at the table and talk about making reductions here and there, and making some increases in some other places. I think that their reductions in places like uh, medical research is absolutely crazy because if you are got these guys coming and women coming out with PhDs and there's no money for any kind of research, how do you continue to fill the pipeline of the global health initiative that you have in the state of Washington? Okay, the I... city of the city is filled with that. Let, let me play one more cut for you. This was a congressman uh, on C-SPAN last week that I think you know well. Now, we're in a very difficult period right now because we have a lot of people who suddenly think it's all about me. And it isn't about me. It's about we. If we don't take care of one another and we say everybody's on their own, then it, it will simply fall apart as a society and become a mob scene as it was in Paris. If you go see Les Miserables, you can see what the country can become if you don't have equity in the society. I don't want that. See, I wasn't there to protect you from yourself, but <laughs> you're, you're, saying, well, you're saying we don't want to say you're all by yourself, but isn't it true, Congressman McDermott, that we have 48 million people on food stamps? We have uh, a huge exponential increase in people on SSI, Social Security Disability, in the last 20 years. That in many ways we're more dependent in more ways than ever before. A school district up in Mount Vernon has a federal program that serves breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Aren't, isn't the problem exactly the opposite? We're becoming too dependent. Well... Um, I sort of doubt, John, that any child in Mount Vernon who goes to the breakfast, lunch, and dinner program comes from a home where they get three meals a day at home. So I, I think those programs are developed in response to real problems in the society. And we have lots of problems. We can talk about poverty. If you'd like to have another program on poverty, I'd be glad to <laughs> okay. talk, talk right. to you. <laughs> but but my point was that societies work only when they have a sense of the common good and they're working toward it. And when that stops and people start only thinking about themselves, then then the society begins to fall apart. And you and I, you're young, old enough to have lived through the 60s. You remember when injustice in the society led to problems in the streets. We don't want that. You don't want that. I don't want that. Yeah, nobody wants that. But that's what happens when injustice is not dealt okay. with by the political process. And here's my last question for you, then, on the issue of injustice. Uh, is there a point at which government taxation becomes, in your view, excessive? Is there a point at which the government uh, government's take is too much? Give you an example. The golfer Phil Mickelson said he had figured out state, local, federal tax burden was now 63%. Is 63% from an individual's earnings too much? If not, where would you put that bar? What's too much? A democracy is a process by which the people make that decision, and they make it in elections on a regular right. basis mm -hmm. and they can some countries they're paying 70 80 percent of their income in taxes in exchange they get a pension at the end of their life they have universal health care mm -hmm. they have sick leave they have all kinds of stuff that we don't have in this country so it really is a decision in the country as to whether you want to have those social safety net programs or you don't and and I I don't think there is a right or wrong. I don't think there is an absolute number. I think there is the democracy 
will make the decision. And the tension we have right now in Washington, D.C., and the existence of the Tea Party and all, all of this is, is just simply a demonstration of democracy at work. Okay. Winston Churchill said democracy is a, is a messy form of government, the worst form of government, until you consider the alternative. All the others. That's right. and, and from my point of view, I don't like it to be messy. I wish I could be king for a day and make all the decisions for everybody, but I can't. And the, it never will happen. So I have to play in this messy game and try and get what I think is best. But you think something different. That's fine. All right. But we can talk about it on the radio. Yes, and, and but we'll have to do it again next week. We can only give you this this great highlight once once a week or so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll talk to you, Jan. I got to run to the budget committee. Excellent. Thanks very much. Vote no. <laughs> <laughs> That's Congressman Jim McDermott on Talk Radio 570 KVI. <laughs>